Our final presenter of the Season 10 Bonus Pachaka Cha is co-artistic director of the Kinkanauts, Calgary's long-form improv laboratory. She performs, she coaches, she directs, and she sends a gazillion emails. Give a warm, warm tool shed welcome to Sarah Simpson. Thank you, Jason. I am Sarah. Um, tonight I'm going to be talking a bit about my craft, which is improv comedy. I'm absolutely comfortable improvising in front of all kinds of people with no plan. It feels super weird to have a plan, and my heart is absolutely racing. <laughs> so um, enjoy this very tightly scripted, absolutely written down, not improvised presentation. Now, as people, we all make stuff up all the time, but I specifically make stuff up from eight till nine on Saturdays for a paying audience. I'm the co-artistic director of the Kinkanauts. We're an improvised theater company based in Inglewood. We have about 50 performers. It's our off season right now, and in a year we do about 70 shows. For those of you who aren't familiar with improv, it means we get on stage, we usually get a suggestion from the audience, and then we make up a show. We write the play at the same time as we perform the play. Or you could say we build the plane while we fly the plane. And we hardly ever crash the plane. My craft is improvisation. Weaving stories out of whatever pops into my head. It actually takes a surprising amount of preparation to make something out of nothing. We do rehearse, but we practice technique. We practice storytelling, not the actual story. We practice failing joyfully, which might happen tonight. Because failure does happen, and we learn how to really listen to our scene partner to make sure that we are a part of the same story. The funny thing about improv, aside from the obvious part about trying to make people laugh, is that you can't plan it. If the performers are thinking about it too much, it isn't any fun to watch. But if you don't think about it enough, it is also not any fun to watch. Improv can also be serious and dramatic, and it's that meaty stuff that I really love to perform. Improv is also full of paradoxes. When you start a show, all options are open to you. Any character, location, relationship, and that is both exhilarating and terrifying. And with each choice you and your scene partner make, your world gets narrower, more specific, and that allows you to make it deeper and richer, too. In order to improvise freely, you have to get rid of your inner censor, the part of yourself that's judging yourself, judging your choices, and hampering your creativity. However, you have to keep your inner editor, that part of you that keeps you from saying things that are inappropriate or offensive or just not entertaining. And when we're on stage without a plan, it can make us feel vulnerable and stressed, especially for new improvisers. They often do scenes about throwing up because they feel like they're gonna throw up. And what's on your mind has a way of coming out. And if you're thinking about medieval spits, uh, spit roast, it's because it'll, it, you, you, and you probably are right now, it's just that it'll find its way into the show. Um, we always check in with each other before shows, and that pre-show chat about our lives often gets woven into the show. So before my first improvised Shakespeare show, uh, we were talking about puberty, as you do, and all the metaphors and imagery in the show were about blossoming flowers and the birds and the bees. I do a duo with my good friend Nicole Zilstra called All Request Heartache, and uh, sometimes it has hints of our actual failed relationships in it. I really like two-person shows because you're on stage the whole time, so you don't have time to think about what to do next, and thinking is kind of the enemy of improv. To make not thinking work, we need to know all the rules so we can play together, like in sports. You don't know how the game's going to turn out, but you kind of know what it'll look like. And we do make mistakes live on stage. And just like in life, what matters most is how we respond to them. So if we do or say something hurtful or offensive, we have learned that we have to stop the show and rewind, make a different choice, or in some way own the mistake that we made. And that's the risk that comes with all that freedom. We're free to create, but we also have a responsibility to do no harm. What is true for my character and what's good for everyone else? What did the audience sign up for? These are all the jobs of our inner editor. Thankfully, improv is an ephemeral art form. It's a high-wire act, but both the brilliant and the terrible are gone in an hour. 
A few years ago, speaking of the ephemeral, in 2011, my husband John and I got to be part of a really cool art project. Not because we are cool art people, but because we were tearing down a house and building an infill. Uh, John and I were engaged at the time, and our friend and neighbor, Ashley, wanted to give us an unusual wedding gift. So she asked a friend of hers from ACAD, Caitlin, who I see is here tonight, about commissioning something for us. Um, originally, they talked about it being some kind of art installation on our lawn on the morning of the wedding. But over the course of uh, Caitlin and Ashley's conversation, it came up that we would soon be building the house next door. And Caitlin asked if we would consider letting the artists remake the house, each transforming a room. And so in true improv spirit, we said yes. And that conversation became the house project. These following slides are a, a few shots of the rooms they created. We thought it would just be our friends and the artist's friends, but over the course of the weekend, over a thousand people came and walked through the house. Uh, Fast Forward did an article, and then Swerve did a spread, and I ended up doing these interviews for um, the House Project on a few national news programs. And mostly I talked about in how Calgary we do tear stuff down a lot, but that getting to make room for this project um, offered a bit of redemption. And it seemed like most of the reporters' questions centered on how the artists felt about putting all this work into something only to have it destroyed. And the answer they gave was that it was fine, because there's more freedom in that. There's freedom in creating something that's transitory, something that doesn't need to be a monument standing the test of time. And that's one of the things I love about improv, that it is ephemeral. We create this world, these people, this show, and in the space of an hour, it's gone. And stage plays are wonderful too, but an improvised play has no script and no remount. There's no record, just our memories of it, and also the videos we make to apply to festivals, but we'll just ignore that bit. And now I've lost my place. Um, improv has no safety net, just like this. Um, we end up relying on real life experiences because when we're under pressure, the truth is the easiest thing to remember. And what we do it on the fly and it disappears. And that impermanent bit is part of what makes it so exhilarating. It lets us take huge risks and it helps us to fail joyfully. And then we do it all over again. We write with water on stone. So if I can share something from my craft that may be useful in your own acts of creation, it would be to embrace the fleeting. Revel in whatever aspect is short-lived. It lets you let go. It can release you from the desire for perfection, and you can find magic in the things that you didn't plan, and that in itself is a beautiful freedom.